Welcome back everyone, and this is going to be part 2 of a 4 part series where I take a look at the pre-release builds of Halo Combat Evolved. And in this episode, I'm going to cover the build that was shown off at the 1999 Macworld Conference. This is where Steve Jobs and Jason Jones would present Halo to the world for the very first time. Welcome on the stage, Jason Jones, who is the co-founder of Bungie and the Halo Project lead. Halo is the name of this game. And we're going to see, for the first time, Halo. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. At this point in development, the game was set to release on the Mac as a third-person, open-world shooter. Let's take a look at this build, starting with the characters and creatures. Starting with Master Chief. This iteration of Master Chief is an interesting one. His armor appears to have a gun attached to his shoulder, though we never do get to see it in action. And when compared to the previous build, his armor looks more battle-worn, with some smaller details like scrapes and scratches on the armor. We get a much better look at the elites in this build, and they look quite a bit different than the elites we're used to seeing. Their design is so different from the final release that they're even missing their iconic four mandible mouths. And although the Macworld trailer only shows elites as the enemies, there is actually a few more enemies as well as creatures in this build. In one of Bungie's webcasts, they end up showing us a quick glimpse of the grunt, which does this sort of forward roll maneuver which is absent from the game's release. A few other creatures and wildlife that got cut around this time in development include the Sniper, who, judging by its appearance, it may have been similar to the Hunter, and the fact that it appears to be made of a bunch of worm creatures called the Lagolo. Another cut enemy that has some similar visual characteristics was called the Tank Beast. And although we don't have any gameplay of these cut enemies, we do have this next one. This one here was called the Drenal, and although he just stands around in the gameplay, he does have an idle animation. It also appears that he doesn't take any damage as well. The last cut enemy we'll take a look at in this build likes to disguise himself as a rock, which he aptly gets his name, the Rockworm. If you get too close to a Rockworm, it'll spring out of the ground and start attacking you. That'll cover the enemies of this build. Now let's check out the ambient life. There's the Vulpert, which is part Vulture and part Leopard. And then there was also Three-Leg, who was this three-legged spider looking creature. Before we take a look at the weapons, I need to point something out about this build that would likely cause some confusion. There's two unique Master Chief models in this build. There's the one in the middle, which we see more often than not in both screenshots and in gameplay, while the one on the left shows up from time to time. I'm not exactly sure why the newer model shows up in this build, I couldn't find a definitive answer to that. I'm guessing they were still iterating on Chief's design while still hanging on to the old design. So just as a heads up, you'll see both models of Master Chief in this build. Also, this is a unique model of Master Chief, which doesn't show up in the next build. A notable characteristic of this model is what appears to be an icon on both his chest plate and on his shoulder. You'll also occasionally see two silver spheres floating over the player, which were used by developers to test reflections in real time. Let's take a look at all the weapons that can be found in this build. An early version of the assault rifle makes an appearance, sporting a black exterior with olive green grips. It has two firing modes. One is the grenade launcher, while the other is the automatic mode. If you look closely, you'll notice it doesn't have the ammo counter screen on it. Here we can see the assault rifle's HUD. We can see both types of ammunition used by the assault rifle. The left shows the machine gun ammo, and the right shows the grenade launcher ammo counter. Watch the grenade ammo counter. You can see, as the player fires grenades, the counter goes down. Now let's take a look at the magnum. You'll see that there's a red dot above the gun's muzzle. Notice how it's not glowing? Now check it out in this screenshot. You can clearly see it's now glowing. So why am I pointing this out? Because IGN did a write-up on Halo at this time, which named off all the weapons in the build, and referred to the pistol as the pistol with the laser designator. So with that knowledge in mind, my best guess is that red light might have something to do with that laser designator, possibly indicating that it's primed. You can find even more evidence that the pistol had a laser designator if you take a look at the pistol's HUD, the pistol appears to have a secondary use based on the bar to the right of its ammo counter, which is similar to the grenade count found on the assault rifle. In the pistol's case, I believe that bar may represent when the laser designator was ready to be fired. And one last thing to note about the pistol is that in this build, it has an 18 round clip, where in the release version, it would be a 12 round clip. And that's it for the pistol for now. Let's take a look at the next weapon, which in this case will be the shotgun. It fires just as you imagine it would. An interesting thing to note about this shotgun 
is that it had a flashlight mounted to the bottom of it, which has some pretty impressive lighting effects for its time. We also see another variant of the human shotgun that appears to be lacking a flashlight and also has a shorter barrel. This particular shotgun held only five shots per clip. Next up is the flamethrower, and as you probably guessed, it shoots flames. As far as design goes, it looks radically different than the one that would come out for Combat Evolved on the PC, as well as the Master Chief Collection. The sound effect of it being fired is very reminiscent of the Banshee. Here's what it sounds like in action. This weapon's HUD reveals that Bungie called this weapon the Toasty 21 Defiant Projector. The next weapon I want to take a look at is an interesting one. It's the Machete, or more accurately called the Composite Sword. But for this discussion, I'll just refer to it as the Machete. If you look closely, there's a few types of swipes you can do with the Machete. I'll slow these down so we can get a better look at them. The first swipe is a quick backhanded swing while the second swipe appears to be more aggressive and forward swinging. We also see a third swiping motion that looks like another aggressive swing. My guess is the swing would differ depending on how close you were to the enemy you were swinging at. And finally, there's also a stabbing motion. And although the machete wouldn't appear in the final game as a weapon, it did in fact get incorporated into the different difficulty logos. It can be seen in the normal, heroic, and legendary logos. And while we're on the topic of melee weapons, let's give a quick look at the energy sword. There's really not too much to say about the energy sword. From what I can tell, there's no drastic changes between this and the release version. The anti-air missile launcher makes a return in this build, and we get a much better look at it this time. It holds only one rocket per clip, which means it needed to be reloaded after every shot. On the side of the gun itself, it says aim, fire, reload, repeat. If we take a look at the HUD for this gun, we can see it's actually a variant of the Spanker. Now we don't have any video of it locking onto vehicles in the air, but I'd like to imagine it does since it is an anti-air missile launcher. But until we have more concrete video, that's all going to be just speculation. And speaking of rocket launchers, let's check out how the Spanker's looking. And just like its release, it has a double barrel design that holds two rockets per clip. And aesthetically speaking, it has the same form as its final release, but with a red trim. In an issue of Next Gen Magazine, published in December of 99, there was an article about Halo, which included this screenshot, with a caption saying, After you shoot a rocket, the contrails will actually be affected by the wind that is blowing through the canyon. You have to be careful because the wind currents may also affect your aim. And at the same time, PC Gamer UK published a story covering Halo, which mentions that smoke trails from rockets drift and disperse according to real-time wind variation which also affects long-range sniper shots. This tells us that Bungie either planned, or maybe even implemented, wind that would affect gameplay. Moving on to the Gatling gun, which unfortunately doesn't make it past this stage of development. Which is a shame, because it looked like a really fun gun to use. A detail that surprised me about this gun is that the barrels actually do spin around while being fired. If we take a look at the HUD for this weapon, you'll see that it had the word Needler in its name. I'm guessing Bungie liked the name Needler, and since this weapon was cut, they decided to recycle the name and use it to name the weapon we all know and love as the Needler today. And as to why it got cut, we do have an answer to that question. In an article published by the official UK Xbox magazine, Bungie's Jamie Greamer explains, The chain gun was cut because we decided to put more of the high-powered weapons on vehicles. It was the right decision, but cutting is always a painful process. And the next weapon we're going to take a look at here is the SMG. As you can see here, this thing gave off quite the muzzle flash when fired, which wouldn't have been too big of a deal since it was in fact a third person shooter at the time. Up next is the human sniper rifle, which was referred to as the shovel. Looking at the design, it looks like both the stock and handle had a wooden finish to it. If you look in the upper left hand corner, you'll see how many bullets are left in the clip. And if you look at the icon of the bullet, you'll see that you can't fire the weapon again until the bullet's icons relit which should give you a good idea of what the rate of fire is of the sniper. This next weapon is one of the more interesting cut weapons. It was known as the spear gun, and as the name implies, you could shoot spears with it. The gun could shoot one spear at a time before needing to be reloaded to shoot the next spear. 
And although it doesn't show up in any of the gameplay we have, there might be more to the spear gun than what the gameplay shows. According to Jamie Greamer, things get cut during any development process, especially the kind of organic, experimental process we used on Halo. So lots and lots of ideas didn't make it into the game. One of my favorites was the exploding spear gun. There isn't anything funnier than stabbing someone with a spear and watching him run around until he explodes. Even though that weapon didn't make it in, though, it lives on in the plasma grenade. That happens fairly often. The best parts of something that is cut are worked into the things that don't get cut. So it looks like at one point in development, the spear shot by the spear gun would actually explode, which would have been really cool to have some gameplay of. Now supposedly, the spear gun was intended to be used for underwater combat. If you look closely at this gameplay, it does sort of look like the player might be underwater, and for a very brief moment, if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you see what appears to be a bubble rising from the ground. The 1999 December issue of PC Zone Magazine had a write-up on Halo that has a part that briefly mentions that players are free to roam whether on foot, in ground-based vehicles, in the air, or underwater, which supports the idea that there may have been plans for underwater combat. The plasma rifle looks surprisingly similar to what would become the final product, with the notable exception of the indicator missing on the side of the weapon. There's also the odd quirk that when the gun's fired, its projectile doesn't go very far. This is likely just a result of the gun still being this early on in development. Here's a cut Covenant weapon that didn't make it past this build. I could only find one instance throughout all the gameplay footage of this weapon being fired. So watch closely to see it in action. And in case you missed it, here's a freeze frame of it being fired. You can see it shoots out what looks like a purple beam. So maybe this weapon was used as an inspiration for the beam rifle in Halo 2. And if you take a look at the right hand side of the gun itself, there's a light bar that fills up. This may have been an indicator of when the weapon was ready to be fired. This next weapon has an interesting orange pulse to the back of it. As for the function of this weapon, my guess is that it's probably some sort of shotgun. And the same can be said about this next one as well. But that's just my assumption, based on the short amount of gameplay that we do have. If you look closely, you'll see that the bottom part of the gun rotates after each shot that's fired. Now this gun might mislead you. When you first see it, you might think it's a fuel rod gun. Where in reality, it's a totally different gun. Instead of shooting those green fuel rod blobs, this instead shoots something more similar to a grenade. The firing animation is pretty cool on this one. I'll slow it down so you can see it better. When this weapon's fired, there's a top part of the gun that springs open. Here's a better angle of that happening. You can see that the part that flips open reveals the muzzle, allowing the gun to shoot. Here's what the actual fuel rod gun looks like in this build. It's worth pointing out that the projectile's tail on this weapon is quite long. Here's what those last two guns look like when being fired side by side. I also managed to find the screenshot that captures both weapons in the same screenshot. Next up is a weapon that Bungie referred to as the gravity wrench. This weapon required a short charge time before it could be fired. If you look closely at the smoke trail that gets left by the shot, you'll see that it has an arc to it. Now let's switch our focus over to the vehicles, starting with the Warthog. If you check out the paint job on the Warthog, it actually has a green camo look to it. But not only that, it has a cut feature that wouldn't make it into the game, and that's the driver's ability to shoot their gun while driving. We can see this feature in a few promotional screenshots. These screenshots also show off a tan-colored Warthog as well. Between the screenshots and gameplay we have of this feature, I was only able to identify the pistol as well as the assault rifle as weapons that the driver could fire. The driver could also fire the assault rifle's grenade launcher as well. As to why this feature got cut, well Jason Jones answers that question in a Next Gen Magazine article stating, at first, we were nervous to take the aiming and shooting role away from the player. Instead, we make his job to deploy it, like putting a weapon in the best spot, so as to not let the bad guys get to cover. By making the vehicles so controllable, where the player can hit jumps and make corrections midair to land upright, we keep the driver's hands full. While doing my research for this video, I came across an interesting tidbit that was published in December of 1999 by PC Games which was actually written in German, but I managed to find a translation of it, which reads, Every one of the four wheels is separately hung up, 
so that each take their own damage. Even with three wheels, the Jeep will still run slowly, even over the roughest surfaces. This may have meant that the Warthog would have handled differently had its wheels been damaged. The design of the chain gun on the Warthog doesn't give you a lot of cover, since there isn't a shield built into the gun itself to block incoming fire. In the last video, we saw a variety of human tanks, but none that really resembled the Scorpion. Well, that changes with this build. The Scorpion makes its first appearance in this build, and its main cannon appears to have a higher rate of fire. And just like release, the machine gun can also be fired by the driver. But the Scorpion wouldn't be the only tank in this build. There was also the Stealth Tank. The Stealth Tank had a lower profile than the Scorpion, judging by this little bit of gameplay that we have of the Stealth Tank. It looks like it's pretty far along in development. It also has this cool effect, where fire and smoke pour out the back vents when the tank shoots its gun. And that'll do it for all the human vehicles in this build. Now let's take a look at the Covenant vehicles, starting with the Banshee. The ends of the Banshee's wings light up in the retail build, which they don't do here. When the Banshee's parked on the ground, it actually sort of levitates a few feet off the ground. And finally, when there's a pilot inside the Banshee, the cockpit doesn't close up, it just stays open, leaving the pilot exposed. When it comes to the Ghost, the only thing that I saw that caught my eye in this build was the lack of collision detection between the player and the vehicle. There was another vehicle that was cut around this time, called the Covenant Bomber. Unfortunately, we don't have any further information beyond what we see in this image. Now let's take a moment to look at some of the cut features from this build. The first of which, let your character express emotes, which included bowing down, pointing ahead, a gesture to come over here, a handstand, a roger that motion, a wave, and a victory pose. In this build, characters also had the ability to super jump. The way this move would have worked is that the longer you held in crouch, the higher you would jump. Bungie gave us a couple reasons why they cut this feature. The first of which is once they made the move from third person to first person, they felt it no longer worked from that perspective. They were also concerned that having super jumps in the game would hurt level design. One of the more ambitious features that would end up getting cut is deformable terrain. This feature was brought up in a few different articles. PC Games published an article in October of 1999 stating, that ground vehicles bump about on terrains and make gravel fly. Boats create waves and ripples in the water, and explosions change the terrain to a big extent. It gets brought up again by PC Zone in a December of 99 story stating, In Halo, not only will you find skeletal animation, scalable mesh technology, and reflective surfaces, but multiplayer texture mapping, true deformable terrain, and inverse kinetics. In other words, you'll see realistic body movement, explosions leaving craters, buildings slowly crumbling, and warped images of yourself in the reflection of a Jeep's wheel arch. And the last piece of media I want to bring to your attention is an interview with Jason Jones conducted by Inside Mac Games. Jason was asked, there's been talk of the formable terrain in Halo. Can you explain further? Were the dust and small rocks from the demo a part of this? His response is that the formable terrain referred to in the release is the terrain mesh. In Myth, there is a terrain mesh, but it's static and doesn't change in response to the events in the game world. In Halo, if there's a huge explosion or an orbital strike on a piece of flat ground, it'll leave a hole that is a permanent part of the landscape. The rocks and dust are particle systems like the weather in Myth. Nature is full of particle systems, and if you want to create a natural environment, you gotta have particle systems all over the place. And although I couldn't find any video of the terrain being deformed, the crater in the center of this picture looks like it could have been created with a deformable terrain environment. Not only could the terrain be deformed, but it looks like there was also plans to have the wind effect gameplay as well. This image, which comes from a Next Gen Magazine article, states, After you shoot a rocket, the contrails will actually be affected by the wind that is blowing through the canyon. You have to be careful because the wind currents may also affect how you aim. One thing that Bungie had planned this early on was mod support. This gets mentioned in a PC Accelerator article that was published in May of 2000. The article goes on to say that the engine has been constructed with player refinements in mind and map editors will ship with the game. 
Developers want to make Halo simple to manipulate, with the hope that Halo fans will create more mods and maps than even the Myth 2 community. In fact, Bungie expects Halo to be more customizable than Myth 2. A bold statement indeed. The last feature I want to touch on was mentioned in PC Gamer October of 99, stating that dynamic weather will add even more graphical punch to the action. I haven't seen any gameplay or screenshots of snowfall or rainfall, but as you can see here, there is some gameplay with the snow already on the ground. The last topic I want to bring up real quick is the control room. We can see it's been updated quite a bit since we last saw it. The room's been completely redesigned, and now has a bunch more holograms in it as well. The floor in this room is donut shaped, which is similar to the final release. And that'll do it for my analysis of the 1999 Macworld pre-release of Halo Combat Evolved. Check out part 3, where I take a look at the 2000 E3 build. And as always, thanks for watching, and have a good one.